called Embedding um, Abolitionist Digital Pedagogy in Education. I'm just going to read a couple announcements uh, as the moderator. I want to inform you that the session is being recorded as you just found out. Um, if you are under 18 years of age or prefer not to be recorded, please turn off your camera um, and remove your full name for anonymity. Um, if a problem occurs and Zoom closes for any reason, uh, first we'd like you to try to re-enter the same Zoom room. And if that doesn't work, you can go to the lobby um, on the visual schedule or of the conference and it's labeled help or Ayuda in Spanish. So I'm going to let uh, Jessica, Sophie and Jordan take it away and they are going to introduce themselves and give you a good workshop. Thank you. Um, I actually think we're maybe small enough that everyone could introduce themselves if folks are comfortable doing so. Um, so I can go first and Sophie, Jordan, and I can maybe do slightly longer introductions um, and then we can go around and if folks aren't comfortable speaking up, they could put an intro in the chat. Um, but I'm Jessica, I use she or they pronouns. I'm a doctoral student at Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Southern California. I study uh, higher education student activism with a focus on students engaging in abolitionist activism. Um, and I am uh, excited to talk about this panel. I actually, uh, Alison is one of my mentors and is kind of the person who has introduced me to uh, critical media literacies um, and had a lot of these conversations starting about what abolition looks like in in critical media literacy spaces. I'll pass it to Sophie. Nice. Hi, everyone. It's so lovely to be here with you all. My name is Sophie Sila. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I am currently a legal fellow at the ACLU of Southern California on the education equity team. Um, I graduated from the University of Southern California Law in May. And before that, I was in education. So while at USC Law, I focused on human rights, uh, education equity, racial justice, arts justice, and abolition. And I was able to meet Allison Trope and was lucky enough to have the opportunity to do some media literacy work, which was amazing, and met Jessica that way as well. Um, and currently, my fellowship at the ACLU focuses on youth criminalization, um, largely in the Inland Empire, focusing on the abolition of school police. Uh, and my work entails direct representation, impact litigation, community organizing, and policy work, amongst other things. And I will pass it to Jordan. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited for today. So my name is Jordan Harper. I use he, him, his pronouns. And I am a third year uh, PhD student at the University of Southern California in the Rossier School of Education. And I'm getting my PhD in urban education policy with a higher education uh, focus. So um, my research interests span uh, leadership, like higher education leadership. Um, I look at uh, support staff in higher education, but a lot of my work is oriented towards alternative futures um, within higher education. So how can we dismantle um, oppressive and inequitable structures and systems um, and erect something better in its place. Um, so I'm super excited to be here with you all today. And um, yeah. Thank you, know, if, um, so I, if I can maybe just call on folks to introduce themselves and you can pass if you're not comfortable doing so, but uh, I'll do Ali as you're next on my screen. Thank you so much. My name is Ali. Uh, I'm a six year PhD student at UMass Amherst in teacher education and curriculum studies program. Uh, I'm working on my dissertation proposal. Um, I also teach an education and film class that we are um, watching Hollywood movies with a race, gender and social class lens and try to teach college students um, critical media literacy. That basically my research interest at the same time. I'm, I'm interested in how do we assess critical media literacy? How does it look like in a classroom setting? How can we teach it better? Especially with white teachers who are gonna be, like who is the white female teachers, the majority of the, um, um, uh, the, the teacher workforce and how 
the identity mediates shape their critical media literacy learning. So it's it's a pleasure for me to be here um, to learn from others. And um, I'm so happy to be here. Take, thanks for organizing this amazing uh, conference. Uh, am I supposed to, to pick the next speaker? If you wouldn't mind, that would be great. Um, okay, very cute dog. I know, Lise. Um, Annalise, I don't know if you caught that, but we're asking folks to introduce themselves and Ellie called your name. Um, or if, oh, you see Mike isn't there. If you want to put something in the chat then, and then um, maybe we'll go to Claudia. Maybe not. Um, if maybe if folks want to unmute to introduce themselves if they're comfortable doing so. Okay. Um, I'll introduce myself. Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, I am a first year PhD student at UMass Amherst Department of Communication. Um, I'm interested in media literacy and digital literacy and I think um, critical ed tech research. I'm a former uh, technology integration specialist at a middle school and then a high school. Um, and yeah, I got really uncomfortable that my job was to integrate these technologies that I really not only did not believe in, but was really like worried about. Um, and so I'm grappling with my feelings about my, my role there and just thinking about like how, how I can, um, I don't know, disrupt shift what's what's happening in k-12 institutions um, i see my friend ralph so i'm going to call on you ralph hi michelle it's really hi. good to see you um, my name is Ralph Bellavo. I teach at the University of Oklahoma. I'm the area head for creative media production and professional writing. Um, I, my areas of teaching are documentary stuff about horror and uh, um, media criticism and some other stuff. Um, and I've been writing lately about um, Gramsci and media literacy. Um, so um, that's that. I, so should I pick someone? How about Jan Martin? Did I do that right? Jan Martin? <laughs> um, okay, what about Benjamin Thompson? Oh, he's Benjamin's put a uh, description in the chat. So uh, they're a fourth year UCLA undergrad studying English and education, planning to earn their master's credential next year and eventually teach high school English in Riverside, which is lovely. Um, I'll just do Stephen, who's next on my screen, if you want to introduce yourself, Stephen. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen. I'm a third year. Um, education and social transformation major at UCLA. Um, and uh, I want to be a, a future educator or counselor at a high school. And uh, I want to pursue graduate degree in education after my undergraduate program. And I was introduced to uh, critical digital media literacy by Professor Jeff Scher and Andrea was my uh, TA. And since then I've become really interested in the topic and I'm just so happy to hear uh, everyone's thoughts on this and all the awesome discussion. I'm actually the Zoom recorder, but um, thank you for giving me a chance to introduce myself. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure who hasn't gone. Um, maybe go to Olivia, if you haven't gone yet. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Olivia. I am a student at um, Cal State University Dominguez Hills, and I am also a library assistant at an elementary school here in California. Um, I believe critical media literacy is very important um, 
so much more now after the pandemic and whatnot, everything just shifted and technology has um, had had a huge impact now where as a, a educator and parent, I feel that it's important how we manage um, um, educating our students through media because it's they might be accustomed to seeing certain things or doing certain things, but when you are actually trying to educate educate them, I feel that the focus shifts a little. So you need to um, we need to find ways to have everyone collaborate and not think of all work as just individual work. Thank you so much. Um, Amanda, I don't know if you would like to introduce yourself. Yes. Oh, I, I would turn on my camera today. Um, hi, I'm Amanda. Um, I am at New Mexico State University as a doctoral candidate where I'm finishing up my dissertation that's looking at racial and gender traits in uh, characters of preschool apps. I also do work at the Learning Games Lab at the institution, which creates games and animation. So I lead our user testing as well as teach our summer sessions to children and youth about design. So it's like I have two lives of being with designers as well as being an educator. And then I'm also a research fellow with New America with their educational policy program, and they have an inclusive tech team, and I work on some policy work. Yes, three lives. <laughs> That sounds like a huge amount of work. Um, and then John, if you're there. Or if uh, Jan Martin has returned, if not, we can. Okay, um, so thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, I'll preface this with, I think um, we're hoping None of us would consider ourselves experts in the topic. These are just things that interest us and we're really excited to hear other opinions and thoughts as well. Um, but we do have a brief intro we're gonna go through um, before we get to the discussion, just to kind of think about how we're framing this. Um, so I'll, I'll start. So uh, with the onset of the pandemic in March 2020, educators, including ourselves, uh, found ourselves rapidly adapting to an entirely digital space where every pedagogical interaction became mediated through a series of digital platforms and apparatuses. Um, through this, we watched the relationship between classroom logic and technology become far more visible than it had been before. Um, by classroom logics, we're referring to what Hackett and Turk define as a system that confines, entraps, and inca incapacitates, and renders people as objects and exercises control over them, um, which we think kind of follows Freire's definition that classroom logics are oppressive in that they prevent men from being more fully human. Um, so this workshop will look at how technology plays a role in reproducing dehuman dehumanizing classroom logics and how it can, if utilized correctly, resist those classroom logics in the classroom. Um, one of the key examples and kind of our starting point for this uh, in the pandemic is how technology has allowed schools um, and in the case of K through 12 education, the government to enter students' homes, right? Uh, proctoring technology in particular has normalized the constant surveillance of students and then equally impacted students of color, students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, trans students, undocumented students, and students with disabilities. Uh, technology during the pandemic then has further engendered an environment of distrust and perpetuated what Bettina Love calls the educational survival complex. This distrust is of course harmful for student learning uh, and this centering of classroom logics and distrust in the classroom were in place long before the collective move online, but they've become intensified and have expanded in codification over the year. And I think we're still seeing them remain in our classrooms, even though some of us are transitioning back to person, in person. As abolitionists, students and educators, this has led the three of us to ask the following questions. How can we imagine the classroom, both K through 12 and college classrooms, relationship to technology differently? And how can technology benefit abolitionist pedagogical, pedagogical practices for the classroom, allowing us as educators to foreground the life-giving and life-sustaining possibilities of education? Um, we're first gonna name a few of these possibilities that we've come up with for engaging with technology in the classroom as abolitionists before going into breakout. Oh, actually, I think we're not going to do breakout groups um, before probably staying all together unless a lot more people join between now and then um, to work through these ideas in the texts. 
together. Yeah, so um, our approach to the abolition of the carceral state um, is one that uh, requires both the negative destructive work um, of ending the prison industrial complex or PIC and the positive life affirming and sustaining work of creating new and better societies. So we believe that both can be implemented in the classroom. Um, in Race After Technology, Ruha Benjamin asked, in the breathless race for newer, faster, better technology, what ways of thinking, being, and organizing social life are potentially snuffed out? If design is treated as inherently moving forward, that is, as the solution, have we even agreed upon the problem? Given this critique of technology's investment in progress, and in light of the rise of surveillance technologies in educational spaces, the first abolitionist pedagogical relationship with technology we're offering is one of refusal. Benjamin also notes that an informed refusal is seated with a vision of what can and should be, and not only a critique of what is. So in this way, refusing technology is using technology. Refusing technology means we can center protecting students' data over sharing it. Uh, refusing technology could also mean that we ask ourselves serious questions about using different software. Um, it certainly means not using Turnitin, for example, and not using proctoring technologies. It may mean refusing Zoom recordings or Blackboard or school email, depending on the access we want the institution to have to our class engagement. Within the classroom, be it physical or metaphorical, um, we can also use technology to challenge some of the fundamental flaws in traditional education. Technology through collaborative software can allow us to be both teachers and students, something that Freire talks about. Um, we can start syllabi from scratch, act as participants in group projects, or provide uh, process uh, feedback to students. In Teaching to Transgress, Bell Hooks uh, challenges educators to aim for this self-actualization within the classroom. Um, so this could look like discussing our own experiences to ground our theoretical conversations. Um, in resisting the educational survival complex, uh, Bettina Love argues that building community requires us to be accountable for one another's survival, to fight for students we will never meet or see, and to embrace and center joy, care, and love to allow us and our students to move towards self-actualization. This means we need to think seriously and critically about what media we engage with in the classroom, especially when it comes to teaching um, about violence. We can share images of resistance, joy, and love in conversation with educating about structural violence. Okay, um, so we've also been thinking about how technology allows us to produce and center different types of knowledge production in the classroom, allowing us to, as Carney and Moten described, be in but not of the university or school. So some ways we see this happening is through accountability. So for example, referring, uh, reframing who our knowledge production is accountable to and being in contact with those people. Uh, changing our relationship to archives, both the way we create them and who they're accessible to, cr uh, critiquing communicative capitalism, so using university resources, if you have them, to address uh, the cost of calls, email stamps for incarcerated community members. Um, we can create, support, and use uh, open source data, such as prison policy data when teaching. Um, or maybe it means creating resources that challenge the boundaries of the university. For example, creating public syllabi or research, resource documents of local alternatives uh, to calling cops or what to do when you see somebody getting arrested or if you're getting arrested. Um, these methods primarily query the dehumanizing practices of the institution through using institutional resources in ways they were never intended to be used. And finally, we might think about how we can imagine a new and better world in the classroom and then uh, work to create that world. So Benjamin notes that the carceral imagination limits not only our beings and bodies, but also the many fixes proposed. So how can we combat that? Um, we must use creativity uh, to freedom dream while remembering Toni Morrison's note that all paradises, all utopias are designed by who is not there, by the people who are not allowed in. And so examples of individuals doing this creative work, and I can share links in the chat. Um, we have the Nat Ministries, challenging capitalism through rest uh, and creativity and joy. Complex Movements, a Detroit-based artist collective exploring the connections of complex science and social justice movements. Uh, Solitary Gardens Project, which is working with currently and formerly incarcerated individuals to turn solitary confinement cells into garden beds. Uh, freedom Dreaming at CUNY, and again, I can share these. 
Uh, Benjamin notes that racism and carcerality are innovative and future oriented. And so anti-racism and abolition work is often playing catch up. So I think today we're really gonna talk about how to innovate, especially during these times. I know in many ways, COVID and, and everything going on, it's been extremely dark, but I think that it also offers a lot of space for innovation. And so we can discuss that more today. Abolitionist pedagogies necessitate us to dream bigger and technologies could help or hinder us. And so I heard somebody talking about disrupting K through 12 and I'm really excited to talk about that more. Thanks for sharing the links, Jessica. So I think I'm going to pass it over to Jordan. I also wanted to mention, I didn't say before, but I was also a teacher before law school and I taught art. And so I've heard a lot of really interesting work you guys are talking about. So I'm really excited to be in this group. Cool. So um, I think how we are going to get started today is um, we initially were thinking through breakout rooms, um, but we have a small enough group. So we kind of want everyone to uh, really get to hear and experience all the amazing things happening in K-12, undergrad and graduate uh, classrooms, thinking through ways that we can innovate towards um, abolition. So I think, Jessica, did you wanna start us off? Oh, you're, you're muted. <laughs> okay, I pressed it, but failed to press it, obviously. Um, so, so I, I think the thing that I have been thinking a lot about in terms of what technology can allow us to do in the classroom is, is how technology allows us to remove barriers. Um, and I think kind of some of, there's some obvious things there about like accessibility barriers, but, but I'm thinking more like very literally it allows us to go past the walls of the university or of the classroom. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll, uh, Ruha Benjamin talks a lot about interdependence in Race Against Technology and, and I think that, and how interdependence allows us to work towards collaboration, which is something I think a lot about um, and, and what that means about like who we want to be interdependent with, who we want to be liberated with. Um, and probably all of us would agree, agree that uh, there are people outside of the university or outside of the classroom we want in, in those conversations who are generally excluded from them. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about the way that technology allows us to bring uh, community members into the classroom. Um, I'll actually, uh, I, I taught a class on abolition in fall of last year and it was all on Zoom. And one of the things uh, we were able to do is have someone who was incarcerated call in to the call and like speak to the students about the classroom. And I think um, for me, that's like one of the really powerful things that technology allows us to do. Um, and so, so there's that. I think it also, as this conference speaks to you very well, um, allows us to challenge nation state borders, right? And bring in, bring in people from other countries. And I think we can think about that really seriously in terms of how how we think about who education is for and, and maybe how that will even allow us to uh, challenge some of the constructs of like national and international students. Um, I, I did my undergrad at UC San Diego and um, like there's in the UCs and I'm sure this is true of other schools, there's this real obsession about how education is for this for the state, right? And, and a real willingness to reproduce the notion of the state um, and of the nation that I think people don't question enough the violence of. Um, I also think a lot about how um, for a lot of us, education requires us to leave our communities um, and separate ourselves from our families and the people we grew up around and the people who have, uh, if we're lucky, you supported us, and that technology can allow us to bring those people back into the classroom. So I'm I'm thinking a lot about like what what does it mean to like invite our parents into the classroom via technology when we're giving class presentations, right? So that they can see us. I'm I'm sure I think a lot of people named they were doctoral students. Uh, I I think a lot about how my parents truly do not understand what I do. They they do not understand what a PhD is. They do not understand like how I spend my days. There's, 
there's definitely a, an assumption that like I read a book a week and that's that's what I, and then I get a piece of paper at the end right and and so um I think technology can allow us to invite them into these spaces um in really beautiful ways and and that can combat some of the um particularly for folks from underrepresented communities like some of the violence of that separation um and then I also think technology can um, push back against the neoliberalization and privatization of education. So I want to I want to share four examples um, for folks who are interested in these, and maybe they've heard about them before. Um, that I'm going to put in the chat. So there's the Anti University Now, which is a UK-based university, um, actually responding to like a historical uh, anti university in 1968. Um, that is trying to provide education. Um, also in the UK, there's the Free Black University, which is um, pushing back especially against kind of the anti-blackness of higher education and um, the obvious class dimensions of that as well. Um, and then a little bit like more locally focused, um, again, I will went to UC San Diego and what's been happening there in recent years is, uh, is this People's University. Um, and so they're trying to do, it's open to anyone, but they're particularly trying to do work in San Diego and bringing in people who wouldn't traditionally have access to the university. Um, and then, finally, sorry, my computer's being very slow with loading this. I should have preemptively loaded them. Um, this is the University of the Poor, um, which is, probably obviously pushing it, pushing back against the class dynamics of the university. So I thought I would um, name those. And then I have probably too many questions um, that I'm gonna put in the chat and people can, and I'll read them out as well, but, but people can see which of these questions interest you and which we wanna discuss. And we'll do that maybe until I'll give myself the time limit of until tw for like eight minutes um, so that we have time to get to the other section. So, so I'm thinking a lot about who is traditionally prioritized in higher education spaces, what boundaries are drawn to prioritize these people and communities, and then who can we bring in to challenge those who or what can we take out of universities? And I don't mean exclude, I mean like resource wise, like how can we get resources out of universities? Um, how do how do resisting these boundaries change our relationship to education and and how can like pushing back against these boundaries reframe reframe the goal of education to one of liberation um which is certainly why i am here <laughs> so i don't know if anyone wants to if anyone wants to talk about any of those or has a particular question that appeals I'll just start by by saying I think you know, especially in the last uh, five years or so, um, I feel like there's been an uptick in universities trying to pay attention to so-called campus climate. Um, certainly, trying to be more sort of proactive in in bringing more people in, as you say. But I think um, most of us who work within these spaces also feel like these actions are are performative in a lot of ways, um, are, are sort of just to tick boxes um, around diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. And so I think for me, one of the key questions is how do we, how, how can we push back against the very traditional space of the university and the traditional space of the, the university structure? Um, the provost office, the president's office, all of the, the power structures that that kind of um, are the overlords of the university. And there is such a thing as faculty governance, but but how how can we operationalize that on a on another level at a different plane? Yeah, I think I think I'm actually finding it really useful um, to think on on the small scale. So for me, these questions are very much just about like an individual classroom. And I think sometimes within the individual classroom, we can do a lot without asking for permission. Um, but 
that can't happen when we start thinking bigger. And also I'll name, I'm particularly thinking about that as like a doctoral student and someone who I don't want to wait until I um, have like the safety of a long time experience or tenure or whatever eventually happens to be able to push back against these things. Yeah. Happen. Yeah. So you go, no, Sophie. I cut you off. No, that was the end of a thought. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just, I, Al, Allison's point really, I was just thinking about this last night, and I think coming from USC, which is quite scandal ridden, um, you see just the amount of corruption that exists. And so I really truly asked myself last night can these institutions, will they ever truly be able to support a certain group of people? Um, was I truly supported there? Did I truly get the quality of education that I frankly am going to be paying off for the rest of my life? So I think bringing up this idea of what we can do in our individual classrooms and as a teacher, I also felt like I lacked power so often. It's like, really, what can we do at those, you know, base levels? Because oftentimes I think the systems that are in place are just like so great that I don't know, I guess I'm feeling a little bit, a little bit jaded today <laughs> after the past and yet another scandal. Yeah, Ralph, I see uh, the last two years. And I think, I, I think we also see that from like K through 12 to higher ed, you know, like, yeah, education is struggling right now. Yeah, I, I guess I, you know, just to maybe add just a little thought to that, I think that, um, you know, I, I teach in a red place and there's immense pushback from, uh, oh, the legislature, the governor, the boards of regents, you know, all of those levels that are, and, and again, you're all probably aware of these struggles over content and struggles over attempts to try to move in a more positive direction and running into walls about that. So it's, um, the ins these institutions, I think, have been under a reasonably coordinated attack, particularly over the last 15 years. Um, and and that, that's something that concerns me, too, is that sort of external, as much as internally, lots of really bad decision making and corrupt practices and all of that. But externally, there's also an enormous amount of like unfounded uh, misplaced criticism. Um, so just just to mention that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think that when I start uh, thinking about those on top of it, it gets to be a little bit too much sometimes, <laughs> but I, I, I agree. And that's also, by the way, I mean, I acknowledge the privilege of all of those spaces and talk to students about them real regularly too, so. Um, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, like the external pressures. I, I've, I've been reflecting on this um, in the high school I was working at um, in the last couple of years and how like externally there was a lot of distrust about like what teachers were doing. Were they working hard enough during the pandemic and were they offering a education worthy of like what parents expected? Um, and it, I, it seemed to me like the distrust that, that the public had, then teachers kind of passed on to their students. And then there became this, like, um, this sense of, I need to make sure my students aren't cheating. I need to make sure that like, I can keep on top of like what my students are doing. And so, um, I don't know, just the way that like those really negative external pressures can get filtered into the classroom. And sometimes like, I, I felt like the most radical thing that we could do was just to like, keep the, that distress out and just like, and just with students, just like, I don't know, share power a little bit in that little space that we have together um, and just like co-create meaning together. And that is, um, yeah, it's a small thing, but it also demonstrates to young people that like, there's another way, like we together can reimagine something different. Um, and this has nothing to do with technology, I guess. Um, but but yeah, I mean that I guess it's all connected and and the um, the classroom culture is going to, of course, like filter how technologies are put to use or not put to use. Yeah.
I'll, and I'll say, I think also something we forget sometimes is that um, a lot of the time students are bringing that distrust in based on their previous experiences. Um, like it's not just us. So, so it's not only that we don't bring that in, it's we need to like teach them that they don't have to bring that in either. Um, I'll name, I'm, I'm TA in for Alice in this semester and, and we had a midterm last week and a student asked me if they should if they should all take off their smart watches before the midterm began and I was like you figured out how to code the like 38 pages of notes into your smart watch for this midterm then you go ahead and use it like <laughs> like please because you could have spent that time studying um and it I, but I find it so heartbreaking every time that that they're just ready to be distressed to be distrusted right like that is their expectation of the relationship between teacher and student um is that is that they are waiting and and not and not just distrusted right but surveilled and policed um which is i think sometimes we don't i oh, i hope a lot of faculty aren't realizing the level of surveillance and policing that is what they're doing um but yeah, to I mean, yeah, I've I've watched students like empty their pockets and turn their pockets inside out before going to the bathroom, and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> I don't mind. Um, so I find yeah, trying to create like undo that work that other people have have done to them is really difficult as well. Um, I want to make sure Sophie and Jordan have time to speak, um, so I'm gonna pass it on to I think. Uh, Sophie, um, but who we can definitely return to these conversations throughout as well because everything's connected. <laughs> that is actually like the perfect segue. I think the other way that we can see that manifest, that surveillance, that power structure is in creativity in students. And so something I ran into all the time because I hated school growing up. And so my classroom was all about challenging structures and my ma master's thesis was on movement in the classroom. And so a lot of my projects were like, go figure it out <laughs> and then we'll go over it. And I had students approach me so often, like, how do we do this? Or, but what do we do? And I was like, just go, like, just create, just try. And that's just even challenging that, like, is, is a, it's like something teachers have to do in and of itself. Um, and so I, like I said, I, I was an art teacher and, and have done a lot of work in arts justice and access to the arts. Um, and so one other thing I wanted to say today was in the spirit of abolitionist uh, pedagogy and, um, you know, of course, like move around, cameras on, cameras off, drink water, like this is all of our space. Um, and I know Allison said a little bit of, of that in the beginning. But I think for me, um, so during COVID, I, I gave out art supplies and, and a curriculum that I built to youth around LA. And I also worked for a conflict resolution and mediation organization and um, worked with them to create a curriculum that um, implemented the arts. So it, it allowed students to explore conflict resolution, mediation, restorative justice and communication through the arts. Um, and so I just really thought that while this might be an opportunity for schools to cut the arts even more, it's also an opportunity to, to bring the arts into the home for children and in a lot of spaces where they might not have access. Um, and so one artist I wanted to introduce you on, I'm gonna share my screen actually quickly, just because I wanted to show. Um, hmm, is it going to work? Oh no. Okay. I can send a link if I'm not going to be able to share screen. But Deanna, Deanna Van Buren, and um, I mentioned it before, but she's an architect who uh, redesigns prisons and spaces uh, to center restorative justice. And so she talks about how when she was little, she would create what she called the healing hut. And it was just like made out of branches and twigs and sticks. She would go into the woods. She was experiencing racism as a child and she would be in her healing hut. And, and that led to the work she does today. And so my example of that is that when I was a kid in class, I always imagined and wanted to have a bed in the classroom. Like I was just a sleepy kid and the thought of being able to lay down during class was like just my absolute dream. And then 
reflecting on that today and some of the work I do in, in terms of uh, rest ministries and, and rest as revolution and centering joy and creativity and trying to do the best I can doing that while doing this work and being a black woman in this world. Um, like how, how can we center rest in schools and how can we reimagine spaces and redesign spaces um, to allow people to be fully human because like so many kids are tired at school and you just cannot learn when you're tired. Uh, similarly, like why are we learning in basements and law schools with no windows and it's just completely dark and there's no ventilation. Um, and I had a picture of a classroom that I really wanna share. Um, it's it's um, a group of children sleeping on camp beds in a school classroom in the 1940s and it's, it's a black teacher and black students and they just all look really relaxed and we can reflect on what things like Brown versus Board of Education have done to um, education in that schools are more segregated now than ever and you know what were black people having those spaces where they could truly be fully human and could truly rest you know how has that changed and so how can we combat some of that as well. And so, like I said before, I think COVID-19 and everything that's going on, while it's exceptionally difficult, it also um, allows space for some innovation. And so I thought today we could take a moment to reimagine, you know, it could just be a second to all close our eyes and, you know, picture your school or for me, like my office right now is my, like a corner of my house. And then I want to try to reimagine that space. So how would you change that space to allow either yourself or your students to be more fully human? Um, if that sounds like something people want to do today. Cool, I see some head nods. So I think we could take like 30 seconds. I can play some music. <laughs> Okay, so I don't know if that was long enough, but I also don't want to take too, too much time. Um, I can just share for me, like, I love being outside. I just imagine a desk, like, basically in a tree. I just want to be surrounded by plants and animals. And for me, like, I think my dream of all dreams, if I could ever do it, creating some sort of outdoor learning center. And especially being in Southern California, I'm like, why is USC not just an outdoor campus? <laughs> like, why isn't all learning happening outside? So that is my reimagination today. And I'm gonna pass it to Jessica and I'm hoping she shares one she shared the other day. Oh, I already don't remember what I shared the other day. Do you remember what I shared? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I'll say that. Um, well, I'll, I'll firstly say um, that what I was thinking about is I'm teaching in a room where the desks and chairs can't be moved and they're all at an angle and it's, it's reproducing the really clear like student versus teacher hierarchy which is so frustrating to me and there's absolutely no way to move it um and and then and then tying to what you're saying though though I think this has different implications under um COVID but but my biggest frustration is is that is that often happens is when like faculty have issues with people eating and drinking in the classroom. Um, and I I made, and Alison knows because I do this in Zoom meetings as well, but throughout the pandemic, I made a really big point of always eating my lunch on camera or, or cooking my lunch on camera. Cause I'm like, hey, I'm human. If you're gonna schedule something at lunchtime, like I'm gonna make it clear that like I have to perform, like meet my needs. Um, and I, I, I also, I used to, pre-pandemic when I would TA if, if the class was over lunchtime I would be I would eat lunch in class so that students knew they were like invited to do that as well because um, I think like 
like asking student, I mean, again, different right now while we have a global pandemic in person, <laughs> but, but asking students to like wait to meet their basic needs. I mean, even um, I, I'll share like when I found out about that high schools use bathroom passes, I, in this country, I thought I was going insane. I was like, I don't, I don't understand asking permission to go to the bathroom. Like that's, that is not something other countries do. Um, so just like allowing us to have physical needs, um, I think is so important uh, and, and not like, yeah, punishing people for having physical needs is the other thing. So those are, I mean, my, I think very realistic goals for what education could be. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know if, sorry, you guys are. No, 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 no. Oh, I was going to, I was just going to pass it along. So that was. Oh, cool. Well, I was just going to say, I think part of what I wanted to talk about or ask is what pushback you expect, because so many of these things do, do see so seem so simple and human. And yet, like, especially right now, just reading what <laughs> the way some educators function and the way some school districts function, it's truly shocking. And so, like, Jessica, I just wondered, all the desks are attached to the floor. So could you create a classroom that's so free? And obviously COVID like changes things, but that students are allowed to just like sit on top of the desk or come sit on the floor near you in front. Like how, how free of classrooms can we truly create? And maybe we'll pass to Jordan. Um, yeah, so I was kind of thinking about like, um, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, obviously everything was virtual. Um, and then now we're kind of in this, some people are like fully in person and we have some hybrid options. And for me, like, I think I would be interested in a classroom in which like hybrid is always an option um, so that we can A, invite other voices into the conversation that we're having, which kind of breaks breaks down the the walls of the academy, um, but also, you know, sometimes you just don't want to be in class. Sometimes you feel safer at home. You feel a little bit more comfortable in contributing to conversations while you're in your own space versus um, in a space with 15 to 20 other people, sometimes in lecture halls of 100 plus. Um, so for me, I'm always thinking about ways to um, reimagine classroom space. Um, and with, I think, COVID kind of showing us that hybrid is an option, uh, whether we're being forced by the hybrid option or we're, um, or we're choosing to go hybrid, um, I would imagine a classroom in which hybrid is always an option and students could, um, you know, engage in person or online as much or as little as they want so that they always have the option um, to whether to be in person or online. I love that, especially the breaking down the walls of the academy. It's it's so real, making it accessible to everybody, like truly changes yeah. what it is. Exactly. I was wondering if anybody wanted to volunteer to share or type in the chat, or we can also. I'll just say what I said in the chat, but I, I feel like on the tech affordances side, um, having being able to create breakout rooms on the fly was amazing because in, in the classes I teach, when I do group work, it's always this kind of confusion and you know, where are you going to go? And how do you, like Jessica said, how do you use the room? Um, and then the chat I found so amazing because there were people that just never would speak in class um, that would use the chat. And also the, the use of the chat was less intimidating, I think, for most people because you could just sort of use vernacular and you could just sort of, you didn't have to feel the pressure to perform um, a certain academic position, you know? And, and so I really loved the way students in general embrace the chat. And I feel like participation was much higher actually in some ways um, on Zoom than, than uh, it's been in person. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I see another person who's a fan of the chat. Um, I guess, cool. I guess if nobody else wants to share, um, Jordan. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. All right. So um, I want to kind of wrap us up here um, very briefly because I know we're running out of time, but um, I have been thinking about um, graduate education and um, graduate schools and um, what the classroom can look like in those spaces and how we develop um, you know, researchers. And like, you know, you think about doctoral programs, you can think about some master's programs have a research orientation, um, but how can we, you know, create and develop abolitionist researchers? And how can we reimagine the classroom space as um, a space for organizing? Um, so what does that look like? What tools can we utilize? Um, who can we lean on? All that type of stuff. Um, and, you know, I think that graduate students in a lot of ways are surveilled um, or limited by these structures and external pressures um, that aren't necessarily like right in front of them or, yeah, maybe they're not right in front of them, but they are things that they basically anticipate that are going to be in front of them in some way, shape or form sooner rather than later, such as the tenure process. Um, thinking about graduate students who want to go down the faculty um, the faculty route, knowing that, or the R1 faculty route, or like the tenure track faculty route, knowing that they're going to have to go up for tenure one day, and that things that they do are going to be looked at um, and critiqued um, by their peers or by their institution. Um, and then even like the faculty job search, this kind of mystical situation that we don't know too much about or how to like land a, a faculty job. Um, but these turn into what I kind of see as these carceral logics that stifle creativity and even meaningful community engagement outside of the walls of um, the academy. Um, so graduate students often fall into this trap um, of publishing or perishing. Like, oh my gosh, I have to like do this as a graduate student to like get the job or to set myself up for tenure um, or whatever the case may be. Um, or they also fall into this trap that they won't be able to like do the work that they want to do out of fear that it won't help them secure the job or get tenure down the line. Um, so if you take this, for example, you know, there's been a rise of anti-critical race theory, discourse, policies nationwide. And what does that mean for the graduate student who wants to study race or racism, anti-Blackness? They want to look deeply um, at critical race theory or they want to use critical race theory as um, a theoretical frame for the work that they do. Well, what ends up happening is graduate students start shying away from studying these things or these like um, these controversial topics out of fear that, you know, I won't get I won't get the job, I won't get tenure, whatever the case may be. So I think so much of it is really um, developing, supporting, affirming these abolitionist researchers, but then also um, in the same vein, challenging these systems and structures that um, are put in place to kind of instill fear or this carceral logic. So um, I kind of thought through some ways to develop and support abolitionist researchers. Um, so first and foremost, I see it as contributing to open and accessible research. So there are a number of databases out there um, that have like accessible data that students can play with, especially around um, the prison industrial complex and uh, what's happening in these prisons. Um, another way is researching the college and university in which they're situated. So like um, one thing that I'm interested in is non-tenure track faculty or contingent faculty. Um, so I'm always interested in like, what is my current institution? Like how are they supporting faculty off the tenure track? how many faculty off the tenure track do we have? Because we know that research shows that we um, are, well, not tenure track faculty are like the majority now. So like how in the world are these institutions um, supporting and affirming those faculty off the tenure track? Um, finding out what supports are in place. Um, and then thinking deeply about the conditions that have created our contemporary society and the situations that we're living through. So that's kind of having like the systems level thinking um, orientation to a plethora of topics um, that we are engaging in. And then also just um, having more of an orientation towards like collaborative work, community oriented work, leaning on networks. So what that looks like in the research space is maybe you're thinking about methods. So maybe you're doing a little bit more participatory action research. You're engaging with people outside of the um, academy or the group that you are 
um, trying to study and you're figuring out what they want. You're trying to figure out like, how can you co-create this research together? Um, I've had the opportunity to engage in a participatory action research project um, throughout the spring and the summer where we worked with skaters, like literally skaters in Los Angeles um, from like 18 to 24. And just trying to see like, how do they, um, how do they create place? Um, how do they do like this place making, space making um, amidst these like systems and structures that are actually like trying to impede on something that's a hobby to some and then something that's like their whole lives like skating um and like we co-created research questions every week looked different like we met up every week on zoom and we were like all right we're going to talk about this or like what do you all want to talk about so engaging this part participatory action research is really um useful to kind of break down these uh barriers between like researchers and the communities that they prefer to serve um, and then also thinking about deliverables outside of academic journal articles, books, book chapters that are behind paywalls. Um, I think that there's a lot of um, utility in doing public scholarship um, and making sure that they are open and accessible to a variety of people because as we know, you know, while you're in the academy, you have access to these things. But for example, like you leave undergrad and you go somewhere else um, and you work in industry, like now all of a sudden you don't have access to your institution's library database. Um, so having these uh, public scholarship deliverables is um, a really interesting way uh, to um, create research that can help everybody. Um, and then also fostering opportunities for capacity building and resource sharing. Um, and then also how I'm also thinking about developing and supporting abolitionist researchers is thinking and um, reading beyond and in conversation with other disciplines. So like as an education scholar, I can turn to black studies and look at some concepts and key ideas that could really help inform some of the work that's happening um, in higher education. Um, or even looking at religious studies, like theology, like what is theology? Like what, do we, what is political theology and how could that possibly be manifesting in other spaces within society? Um, and then understanding how research and researchers can perpetuate harm, I think is really important um, because sometimes we do these drop-ins to the communities and then we like drop out, but you know, we're not doing anything about the harm that we could possibly create um, in those spaces. Um, and then last but not least, just thinking as research as a way to world build. Um, I know for me, I do a lot of like conceptual thinking, theoretical thinking. Um, I know in higher education, especially there's a lot of scholars who do empirical work and they're like committed to the empirical work of like trying to understand what's happening and why it's happening. Um, but they don't take that extra step to like think of these big opportunities to reimagine and restructure and recreate. Um, or, or create different alternatives. So I think if we're going to do the work of developing and supporting abolitionist researchers, we should also be pushing people um, to also world build. Like, yes, tell us what's going on, but also like, tell us what else, what big fantastic ideas we could have for moving forward in um, our society and in the, uh, in the areas that we are trying to change. Um, and there's another, there's a resource, there's a couple of resources I'll drop in the chat. I know we're low on time um, that could help, you know, think through if you are interested in developing, supporting abolitionist researchers. Um, there's a couple of public, um, publicly available data bases that I'll put in the chat. Um, and then also there's a cool like Cops Off Campus toolkit um that is available so these are just other ways to think about engaging beyond the traditional idea of what a researcher does or what graduate students do in the academy and that is it for me yeah i think we have a minute left um if if anyone has any thoughts or questions i know that's a huge amount of information and resources um we've shared uh, Yeah. I'll just do a thank you all for join, joining us. I know, I think we have to leave before the next session can start, but I guess Jordan, Sophie, and I will stick around for 30 seconds if, if, if 
folks have thoughts or questions. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here with us on a Saturday. <laughs> Thank you. Great workshop.